Hello everyone, welcome to the Christian Humanist. I'm Damien. The topic for today is the relationship between Christianity and the incel movement. Okay, so this is an interesting one in the, in the sense that Christianity, which is a religion, a belief system uh, for well billions of people, and the incel movement is, well, after all, a movement, okay? It is a group of men, a lot of men apparently, who are frustrated, who are angry, who are cynical about life, mainly because they are not getting what they want, okay? They're not able to fulfill one of the most basic needs that, that defines us, okay? The need to not just have sex, but critically to be able to fulfill the emotional, okay, the social and the psychological needs that, that is tied to relationships, to intimate relationships, okay? So how do these two things connect, okay? Christianity on the one hand and the incel movement, okay? Well, critically, to start off, the main uh, relationship between Christianity and the incel movement is that they're both movements in the sense they're both occupied by people, okay? There are Christians, men, and there are incels, men, okay? So th there is the commonality. There is the first uh, principle, okay, that unifies both movements, okay? The next issue, the incel movement is predicated on a certain negative, okay, that there's something wrong with the world. There's something wrong with women, especially, okay, in terms of what women want, in terms of women's desires, women's uh, aspirations, okay, and how a lot of men, in this case, a lot of young men, a lot of men in the Western world predominantly, who don't seem to fit into that mold, who don't really fit into that category in terms of what women expect and what men are able to provide, okay? So there is that issue. Now in Christianity, we have a similar problem, which is that the world is fallen, the world is sinful, okay? And we as uh, the faithful are meant to navigate this world, trying to find our way, okay? Trying to do what is right, trying to, you know, fulfill our basic needs and wants, but at the same time to be faithful to God in a world that is working against us, okay? So there are some parallels there as well, okay? The other issue, of course, when it comes to the incel movement is that the people who call themselves incels uh, feel justified in identifying with the movement, okay? They are incels in the sense they feel there is a legitimate uh, argument, okay, that justifies their thinking, that, that justifies their behavior, that justifies their way of life, okay? It's not just a question about not having uh, the ability or the means to fulfill your sexual needs and wants, but it is the reflexive identity that you're saying, look, this is who I am, this is what I am, okay? Women have moved on, women are different, women are, you know, occupying a different kind of space, a different mental space, okay? And a lot of the men who call themselves in cells are essentially out of it, okay? And they are becoming a group in that sense. They are defining their identity, their social identity, okay? And of course, their personal identity as well, okay? This is true in Christianity, as I mentioned, because Christianity is also predicated on the view that the world is fallen, the world is sinful, and the faithful are supposed to walk together, okay, as uh, believers, as people who are committed to the right principle, who are rejecting Satan and his ways, and staying true to who they are, and staying true to the, the correct teachings of God, okay? Now, of course, I mean, that's a rough comparison, but the point remains. The, both of them are movements, okay, and, and that is the starting point of this debate, okay? Critically here, okay? The relationship between Christianity and the incel movement. Okay, the main point I'm trying to communicate in this video is the relationship, or more specifically, how Christianity has become a contributory force, okay? How Christianity, in some ways, is a contributory factor that has given rise to the incel movement, okay? That is like the core argument of this video, okay? And I, would, and I will do so by engaging three main points, okay? Starting with, one, Jesus Christ, okay? In Christianity, the central figure is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior and Redeemer of mankind, okay? The one who brings the good news, the one who embodies God's love for humanity, the one we are supposed to look up and worship and admire and adore and emulate, okay? So critically here, folks, in Christianity, we have a person, the Messiah, the perfect embodiment of God's love, in many ways, the embodiment of perfection itself, okay? And he is the one we are supposed to look at. He is the one we are supposed to emulate. He is the one we are supposed to worship, okay? Critical question here, folks, is that does Jesus Christ correspond or manifest or showcase values, attributes, and principles that you and I would like to see in a man? Okay? Okay? It's a general question. Okay? Do you find these qualities? Qualities like honor, status, money, power, recognition, and critically, the access to women, or more critically, the ability to be with women, to attract women to make women want you, to, to have the kind of sex life and proceed that, the social life where you have the company of women, does Jesus Christ manifest any of those qualities? Does his lifestyle showcase any of those attributes? Does he as a person manifest the attributes of a man that you and I would like to see, that you and I would like to emulate? Is he like, for example, someone like, I don't know, Marlon Brando, a great actor, a popular guy, famous person, Oscar winner, respected, honored, liked, desired, is he like someone like, in a mystical sense, someone like Hercules, okay, a great warrior, a fighter, a killer, and a womanizer, 
you know, there's a story, right? You know, in some some challenge where Hercules, you know, deflowers 50 virgins in a night, okay? And he almost impreg impregnates all of them, like 49 virgins in a night, okay? That's godlike, okay? So it's not, he's not only a god in terms of his heroism, his fighting capabilities, his abilities to confront evil, to destroy monsters, to com accomplish the great tasks that were set before him, but he's also a virile, powerful man, okay? He can get the girls. He's desirable. More pertinently, he's able to get what he wants, okay? Is Jesus Christ that kind of a man? Is he? Now, I'm saying this folks because in Christianity, the central figure of the faith is Jesus Christ. If one, if one speaks of Christianity, Christ is the person who's at the center. Jesus Christ is this. Jesus Christ is that. To follow Christ, emulate Christ, worship Christ, honor Christ, to be like Jesus. Everything revolves around him. If that is the case, okay, if that is the case, we are logically and necessarily required, or better still, compelled to look at him as an example. But then we look at Christ, what do we see? What do we see? Is he a man? in the proper sense of the word. Is he a man in a heroic sense, in a powerful sense, in terms of wealth, status, recognition, respect, and virility? Okay. Does he embody any of those qualities? Does he embody any of those attributes? Does he? The answer is clearly no. So folks, what I'm getting at here is the, one could say, the spiritual foundations of the incel movement. Okay, if you want to look at it that way. You know, Christianity is the Western religion, it's the religion of the Western world. Okay, so the foundational belief of Christianity centers on the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, and in Christ, we have this person who does not manifest any of these attributes that you and I seek, that you and I wish to emulate, that you and I need to manifest in order to be desirable for women. Okay, Because a girl is not going to marry a loser. A girl is not going to go out with a nitwit. A girl is not going to be attracted to some you know, useless slave or a serf or a disempowered weakling. She's not. And admittedly, a lot of these incels, okay, I don't mean just judgmentally, clearly do not fall into that category of heroic, leading, empowered, rich, courageous men. Clearly they don't. And Christ, paradoxically, even though he's held up as a great exemplar of all that is good, does not manifest these qualities. Hence, he is a foundational problem. Okay, good. Point number two, the centrality of love. Okay, in Christianity, love is a central teaching, right? Love is what drives the faithful. Everything revolves around love, to love, okay? God is love. God commands us to love, to love one another as he loved us, to love our neighbors, to love our friends, to love our enemies. Everything is about love. Now, the problem is this. In Christianity, whilst love is so central, everything is about love. God loves us. He came into this world in order to showcase his love for us fully. But if that is the case, okay, what aspect of love do you think is missing? What kind of love is absent in this broader narrative on God's love for humanity, okay? Critically in relation to Jesus Christ, but, but in a general sense as well. What aspect of love is missing? What is it? I'll tell you, the erotic, eros, okay? That is missing. In Christianity, if you look at it, right, the belief system talks about love in a brotherly sense, a brotherly love, okay? Love in a communal sense, fellowship, okay? Agape, giving, sharing, caring. Love as a servant, to be humble, to lay down your life, to you know, the example of Christ washing the feet of his servants, okay? To put yourself down, to weaken yourself, to show that you're not greater, but that you're the least amongst all men. That kind of love, the love of service, the love of servitude, the love in some ways of a slave, okay? To give without expecting anything in return, to share, to care, to give everything away. The love that is descending, not ascending. That is disempowering in some ways, but not aspirational, okay? What kind of love is it? Or more critically, what kind of love is it functionally opposed to? It is the aspirational love, the heroic love, the sensual, the sexual, the erotic, the romantic. Okay, None of those things are present in the, in the love of Christ. Not, not at all, actually. Christ is not a lover. Okay, Christ never exhibited love for a woman. He never showcased the romantic dimension. Or more critically, the, the whole idea of the romantic and the sensual and the sexual are totally absent in the New Testament. You don't find it. Okay, If anything, these things are condemned. The idea of love in a heroic sense, to aspire, to desire. This example is like you see a beautiful girl, okay? You want her, you desire her. How are you going to get her? How are you going to get that girl to like you? How are you going to win her affection? How are you going to get her into your life? How are you going to make her fall in love with you? How are you going to get her to sleep with you? How? What do you need to do? What are What is expected of you? What are you supposed to do? Okay? I tell you what you should not do. You should not run after her like a slave. You should not do good things for her, expecting her to do something in return for you. You should not... Put yourself out there like some good guy, a friend, or, or, a, or a shoulder to cry on in order to win her affection. That's going to turn her off eventually. 
okay? You try to win her over by showing how good you are, how that you're not interested in her sexually, that you don't want to sleep with her, that you all owe you just had to be a friend, to care for her, to love her, to give you everything. And then at some point in the future, if, if that future ever comes, that she's going to like you and respect you. And then she's going to, what, marry you, go out with you, kiss you. Mm -hmm. Guys, I think we know what the problem is here, right? Love in an aspirational sense is one that strives, that fights, that wants to achieve things. You see a great, you see a girl, you think that she's great. You, you figure out a way to get her. How? How? By building yourself up, by leading, by being an exemplar, by being strong in what you do, by being good with girls in general. Okay, we know this, right? Girls are attracted to guys who are good with women in the first place. Okay, you need to be attractive and desirable to women in general. In general, okay. You need to be good with girls in principle in order to be able to get the girl. Okay, I guess with me here. How do we do it? How do we do it? You need to aspire. You need to want great things. It's not just women, but money, power, honor, status, recognition. You need to be striving for those things. You need to be able to love yourself. Okay, you need to be heroic, genuine, and aspirational. In Christianity, you don't find any of that, folks. In Christianity, love is all about service. It's all about giving. It's all about charity. It's all about self-sacrifice. Go in with that kind of mindset into a relationship or a potential relationship. You are going to get screwed. Okay? Hey, guys, look. What is the base of the friend zone? What is the friend zone anyway, right? The friend zone is where a guy tries to befriend a girl, okay, without communicating his intent directly. He's not being clear about what he wants. Either verbally or whether it's in nonverbal communication, he's not showing the girl that he likes her, that he wants her, that he desires her. Okay, he's trying to do everything else to, I don't know, win her affection. Okay, good luck with that. Okay, so I think we know what the problem is. Love that is devoid of the erotic, that is devoid of the sensual, that is devoid of the sexual. That is a central tenet of Christianity. Christianity does not preach love in an erotic sense. I think it was Nietzsche who said Christianity has poisoned eros. Okay, now you might argue with it, you might say that's not true, but the point remains. Christianity does not uphold the erotic dimension. It does not teach you the nature of love in an aspirational sense, in an uplifting sense. And that is a problem. Final point, purpose. What is the purpose of Christianity? Okay, what is the purpose of the Christian faith? What is it? In a sentence, it is about helping people go to heaven. Okay, Christianity is there to guide you and educate you and lead you so that you will end, your soul will end up in heaven, that you'll go to heaven. Okay, that you'll enter, enter through the pearly gates and live forever and ever praising God for all eternity. Okay, is that reality? Is that, is that fact or truth? imbue you with any kind of purpose? Does it push you to live a fulfilling life here? Does it push you to lead a meaningful, purposeful life in the here and now? Does it? Does it? If your whole life is about leading a good life morally, spiritually, etc., etc., so that you can eventually go to heaven and be happy there, okay? Does it teach you how to live here? Does it teach you how to grow, how to learn, how to build yourself, to grow your mind, to develop your physique, to acquire skills, to build your life, to have a better career, to make more money? To succeed, to aspire, and to achieve and attain great things. Does it? Does it teach you any of those things? The simple answer is no, it doesn't. It doesn't because it, it cannot. Christianity, understood properly, the classical view of Christianity, or I would say a simplistic view of Christianity, is more concerned or it's preoccupied with your soul. The ghost in the machine sense of, of the soul, okay? It's all that you, when you die, your soul will sort of float away into heaven or it will you know, reconstitute the body. But it's all about the afterlife, folks. It has nothing to say about life here or nothing. It has nothing to say about how you can build yourself, how you can grow, how you can learn, how you can confront the challenges of this world, how you can fight, how you can make it, how to make money, how to strive, how to succeed. It has nothing to say in this regard, almost nothing. Okay, It's all about forgiving. It's all about foregoing everything. Uh, it's like, as Jesus said to the rich young man, you give up everything here and you'll have riches in heaven. What he's really telling the rich young man is to give up his dreams, to give up his aspirations, to give up his purpose. You see, look, guys, if you have money, that money is not some static thing. You use that money to build things, to build a fortune, to build more wealth so that you can take care of yourself, your family and your friends and the future generations. OK, you do something with it. You build the world around you. If you have no money, you have no power. If you have no power, you are a non-entity. OK, your life is meaningless. You have no purpose. Christianity, if it preaches the good news of going to heaven, OK, to the exclusion of the good news of how you can build yourself in this world, then functionally that is bad news. And the incel movement, okay, is, is made up almost entirely of men who have no purpose, who have no mission in life. They're just going through life. They're just wandering through a maze, okay? They don't know what they're doing. They're just working, eating, surviving, studying. That's it. There's no goal. There's no objective direction, okay? Okay, you guys with me here. Christianity needs to provide that objective, needs to provide that vision for life, for men. And that's not going to happen, folks, it seems. 
Because Christianity, going back to Jesus Christ, a man who does not do anything, he does not achieve anything. He already is God, obviously, so he doesn't have to. That's another thing. But in his life, he never achieved and attained great things in the here and now. Of course, he died and rose again. That's a different story. That's metaphysics. Critically, from the standpoint of men, what did he do? Not much. Did he love? The erotic dimension, it's missing. There's no love in a sensual, erotic, romantic sense. It's gone. It's not, it's not there in the first place. So what are we men supposed to look at? How do, what are we supposed to emulate? Who is the role model for us? And heaven. What is heaven? Well, heaven is basically death. You need to die to go to heaven. So there's no purpose here, is it, folks? There's no mission. There's no joy. There is no inspiration. So in a sense, the incel movement is a product of Christianity. And that's my case. All right, folks, this is the Christian Humanist. I'm Damien. Hope you like it. See you guys next time.